When we paint in watercolor, we have a number of color mixing and blending strategies available to us, and I'm going to demonstrate them for you. The simplest of these is to mix our paint on our palette prior to painting with it. So I'm going to mix a medium value purple, something nice and vibrant and somewhat transparent and just very straightforward. I'm using my quinacridone rose as my red and my ultramarine blue as my blue, and I'm mixing these together on my palette with a little bit of water. There's enough water in this mixture to make things transparent but strong. If I wanted a lighter purple, I would add more water, and if I wanted a darker concentration, I would keep more water out of the mixture and use more paint. So you'll see that I've created a nice, balanced, vibrant, if somewhat red-tinged purple for painting this little heart. We can make use of some other interesting color mixing strategies. So here I'm painting a heart in ultramarine blue, but I'm causing my painting to come into contact with the first painting that I've put on my page while that paint is still slightly wet. You've seen me demonstrate this technique already using the scholastic paints, but here it is illustrated with these student artist material paints, my Van Goghs. The area that I want to call your attention to is where those two hearts join up. You'll see that there is an exchange of water and an exchange of pigment wherever wet watercolor touches wet watercolor. This is referred to as wet in wet blending. So those points of contact are what I want to call your attention to and what I want you to think about as you watch this type of painting and as you think about using these points of contact between wet areas as a way to potentially mix and blend colors. But you can also use this strategy for filling spaces within an image. To demonstrate that, I'm painting this heart with some water. This water is tinged slightly light pink so that you can see it, but I could just as easily be using completely clean water for this purpose. I take the time to fill the full volume of the shape that I'm painting in water, and I make sure that the water fills the weave of the cold press paper that I'm using, and that it's not pooling or beading, but it is successfully wetting the full surface evenly wherever I want to paint my shape. When I'm done with this, I'm going to add some little interspersed areas of red. I pick up wet paint on a wet brush and drop it into a wet area on the page. All of these little star-shaped areas are going to smooth out as the paint dries. I can intersperse these little drops of paint with blue, so these two colors are going to blend, exchange, and interact within this wet wash as they dry. The result is going to be a little bit uneven, a little bit irregular, and very beautiful. This is really as much a texturing approach as it is a mixing approach, but it's worth practicing, learning, and taking on board so that you can use this technique whenever appropriate. Watercolor painting gives us another powerful and unique way to mix color, and this is optically through a process of layering. So I will start by painting a somewhat intense blue heart on one side of my page, and I'm going to make this a gradient by dipping my brush in water one time before I move on to painting the next heart motif, and again before I move on and paint a third heart motif. I want to demonstrate that there is a difference in the color that we achieve through a slow layered buildup versus the color that we achieve by mixing on the palette. There's no right or wrong way to approach your color mixing. There are just different properties to using each technique, 
and there are certain times where you will want to use one approach versus another. This dilute wash is becoming very light, but that's not a problem because we're going to be altering it further and deepening the color. From the other side of my paper, I'm going to start that process in reverse by painting a strong and concentrated heart in my red quinacridone rose color, and then dipping my brush once to move on to another heart motif, slightly more dilute, moving right to left instead of left to right, and then dipping my brush a third time to create a repeat of that same image moving right to left versus left to right. Things get a little crowded here, so I make my last heart motif somewhat smaller than all the rest of them, but this is not a problem. Size variations like that tend to give work a whimsical and fun off-kilter feel, so they're nothing to shy away from. Before continuing onward, your work needs to be dry. I cannot stress this enough. It needs to be completely dry. Watercolor is not dry until you are able to touch your paper where you've painted, and the temperature of the paper will be consistently warm to the touch. You will not feel any coldness or any sense of dampness when you touch the painting where you want to continue layering. If it feels at all cold or cool, your painting is not ready for a consistent and smooth second application of color, and you'll need to wait just a little bit more. So testing is really helpful. Once everything is fully dry, I'm going to approach the blue end of my page with a transparent wash of my red paint and I'm going to smoothly apply a layer of that red over half of the motif that I've painted. This will demonstrate how I achieve purple and what that purple looks like relative to the base color that started it off. So I'm only applying red to this. The illusion of purple is being achieved through the layering of transparent red on top of blue. I'm continuing that process, moving from left to right, to demonstrate the way that these colors look under different circumstances of different concentrations of color. I don't want to work things a lot with my brush because I'm still liable to disturb the layers that I've already painted if I get too aggressive in my paint handling. But Laying down a smooth and consistent wash on top of dry paint will cause some really beautiful blends of color. This is a technique that you will almost certainly make use of for mixing color and approaching color within your painting. Here I'm repeating the process, but this time I'm working from right to left and I'm starting with blue over red. Notice how powerful the blue is versus the red over the blue. Different pigments have different properties of staining and tinting strength. Blue is a color that tends to bully the other colors that it coexists with a little bit. So when you want to use a blue color, such as this ultramarine in a glaze, you will probably want to use less of it than you might be inclined to use if you were working the other way around. You'll gain an understanding of the tinting strength of your paints the more you use them. This is something that becomes intuitive through repetition and through practice. Let's revisit the purple that we painted initially. This is the purple that we mixed on the palette. It's a nice, bright, and uniform color. There's nothing wrong with it per se, but I want you to compare it and contrast it to the color that we created by layering our colors. Compare and contrast that purple with this one 
This is the purple we created by layering our quinacridone rose over our ultramarine blue. You'll see that it has a richness, a shimmer, a vibration to it. It's got a subtlety and a depth that the purple you create on the palette really doesn't approach. Watercolor is a long-term, lifelong pursuit of understanding optical color layering. Consider this the first step on a long and engaging journey.